uh, or one year interdisciplinary master's program um, and this workshop series is a core part of the experience of our students that we open up to the general uh, population of the university, the city, and sometimes the world. Uh, so we have an ongoing partnership with Voice of Witness where we bring um, their authors and editors to come and talk about their work um, whenever they have new volumes coming out. Uh, it's something that's really exciting to us to see the way that they, in a really um, thoughtful and politically engaged way, bring oral history out into the world in the service of trying to make social change and amplify the voices of people and the profile of issues that might not otherwise be very well known. Um, so I'm thrilled to have Audrey Petty here tonight. Uh, she's the editor of High Rise Stories. And, and we've just been sort of talking with her, and we've all quickly gotten the sense that she, she knows what we do as oral historians, and she knows it in a different way and from a different angle um, than many of, the, of us do. So I'm really glad to be able to talk with her tonight. Um, I'll give a little background on her. She's an associate professor of English at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. A Ford Foundation grantee, her work has been featured in Color Lines, Story Quarterly, and Saver, among others. Uh, so welcome, Audrey. Thank you very much for coming and talking with us, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, McKenna. <laughs> Thank you, Luke. Thank you all for coming out tonight. It's really an honor to be here uh, and a thrill. So I, I feel indulged. Um, and I look forward to being in conversation with you. I'd, I'd like to begin by reading a little bit from the book, um, an excerpt from the introduction, and then a chapter uh, from one of the book's narrators. Can everyone hear me back there, too? OK, thank you. On plans and transformations. When the high-rise buildings came down, footage of the demolition was posted on YouTube. There you can find, in montage, time-lapse, or real-time, various stages of destruction of the Robert Taylor homes, Stayway Gardens, Rockwell Gardens, Grace Abbott homes, Cabrini Green, lakefront properties. There are videos of each high-rise of lakefront properties being felled by implosion Collapse occurs not all at once, but gradually, horizontally, with thick, smoky vapors of dust rising in the wake. Other public housing structures were dismantled with cranes, excavators, backhoes. Aside from the jackhammers briskly knocking through windows and concrete, so much of the machinery seems weary. In one video, a wrecking ball appears to move in slow motion as it swings back and then lands, crushing a wall painted robin's egg blue. When the high rises came down, there was official talk about progress. What was afoot was the plan for transformation, a $1.6 billion project and the largest public housing redevelopment venture in the United States. Announced in 1999, the ambitious plan reflected and reinforced national trends. Many municipal governments in major cities like New Orleans and Atlanta demolished swaths of public housing structures and replaced them with voucher distribution programs and limited access to mixed income developments. The Chicago Housing Authority, CHA, unveiled a major advertising campaign to promote its agenda, rebranding itself with a slogan this is change. In promising impacted CHA tenants and the city at large a fresh start. In Chicago, mirroring other neoliberal efforts across the country, planners have relied on the market to regulate the terms of what has been touted as full-scale reform. The vast majority of those directly impacted by wide-scale demolitions have been required to seek out housing in the private sector. For thousands, the outcomes have included displacement, multiple moves, and homelessness. In the current economy, the poverty rate is higher than ever in Chicago, as is the need for affordable housing. When the high rises came down, TV cameras from all over the world were on site. When the last towers of Cabrini and Robert Taylor homes were toppled, coverage was the lead on the 10 o'clock news. 
Scores of tourists and locals alike took snapshots as mementos, as proof. Now 13 years after the demolitions commenced, countless Chicagoans still know these lost places by heart. Eddie Lehman clearly recalls Robert Taylor Holmes, where, for the first 13 years of his life, he lived with his mother. That's probably something you don't even see in a lot of cities anymore, Eddie says. 16 stories, and what was it? About 200 feet, you know. And about 12, 13 apartments on one floor. Each apartment got families. I'd like to share a narrative from Sabrina Nixon with you. And Sabrina spent a great portion of her childhood in Cabrini Green Homes. Um, she moved there from the Old Town neighborhood that's not far from Cabrini Green, where her grandmother lived, her family lived there first. But she was in Cabrini Green for 20 years, between um, 1974 and 1993. And I'll read, I'll read her chapter. So the chapters have little subtitles. I'll read those too. Sabrina's 43, and she's a mother, a freelance writer, and a college student. From real life, Langston Hughes is one of my favorite authors. Back in grammar school, I had to recite his poem, Mother to Son, for a school play. Life for me ain't been no crystal stare. I went to George Muneer School back then, up on Hudson in Old Town, not far at all from Cabrini. We actually lived in Old Town until I was five, and then we moved to Cabrini. One thing I loved about Muneer was that our teachers made such a big deal out of Black History Month. You had to be part of the Black History Month play. I don't care if you were a tree, a plant, or something. You were going to be involved in the play. And I remember having to recite that Hughes poem, and I didn't like it because I didn't really know the meaning of it. At Lanier, they focused a lot on reading. The teachers made sure we had good penmanship. They made sure we pronounced words properly, and they really encouraged a love for books. Do you know the nonprofit called RIF? Reading is fundamental. They used to come around once every six months, and I look forward to following the Encyclopedia Brown series through their book club. All the fast girls, they were into the Judy Bloom books. <laughs> Are you there, goddess B. Margaret, Deanie, and Blubber? I didn't have to rush to go get Encyclopedia Brown because I knew he was going to be there. All the other girls was beating each other up trying to get to the next Judy Bloom. I just strolled on over there, glanced on the table. Oh, Encyclopedia Brown goes to the farm. I hated it when I missed school the day Riff came, because that meant that someone else would pick out a book for me, and then I would get something like, Spot Goes to the Farm, and I'd be so angry. That's really when my love for reading started. As an adult, soon after I had my sons, I started writing. I kept a journal about everyday stuff. Later, I just fictionalized it. I've written a play, three novels, and my fourth book is like Christian nonfiction. It's called Grace and Hope, and it's about how God blesses me on a day-to-day -day basis with me dealing with my lupus and my boy's autism. I became interested in Langston Hughes again as an adult once I started writing. I read his biography and more about how he used the urban experience for the backdrop of his works. The mother to son poem, I understand it now. I tell my son, life ain't that easy, which is what that poem meant. One of my favorite Hughes poems is The Ballad of the Landlord. The speaker is basically threatening the landlord, like, come and see about what I want. Langston Hughes wrote so many good, funny poems, and they come from real life. It's equal, but separate. Some of the most vivid memories I have of Cabrini Green are from when I was a teenager in the 80s. That was when the neighborhood became more crime-ridden. There was a lot of gang activity, a lot of shootings. Wasn't too much drug activity back then. Crime was related to territory, turf, like the movie The Warriors. You couldn't wear certain colors, stupid things like that. Remember the phrase separate but equal? In Cabrini Green, it's kind of reversed, equal but separate. 
Cabrini Green is one big community, but it's sectioned off into different neighborhoods. Everyone there is equal as far as having low incomes, but the separate part is the location of where each building is. We have the reds and the whites. Within those communities, you have buildings going against each other. I vividly remember heading to school every day, walking into my old neighborhood. There's different gangs over there. The vice lords were over in the Old Town area versus the gangster disciples inside of Cabrini Green. We pretty much took a chance with our lives just going to school. We had a boundary, Larrabee Street. Once you crossed that street, you were in a whole new ground of gang territory. I'm sorry, gang activity. I remember getting phone calls from my mom if we were at school or at my grandmother's saying, okay, don't come home right now because they're shooting. Sometimes it could be days before the shooting subsided. We'd stay over at my grandmother's at 1426 Mohawk, about a mile away. That was the most frustrating and critical time, just trying to go out, just doing everyday things. And my mom, you know, she was so worried. A person shot through our door. It happened when I was 13 years old. It happened at nighttime. It must have been summer because in Cabrini, most of us would leave our front doors open when it was warm out. My oldest sister was 18 and she was dating someone who was at the house that night. Me, my parents, my older sister, my middle sisters, and one of my brothers, we all were there. My mother was pregnant with my youngest sister at the time. The guy my older sister was dating, he wasn't a gang member. He was just on the wrong turf. My sister's boyfriend was from the other end, as they called it, from over near Old Town. That night I was braiding my older sister's hair with my back turned toward the door. We had the front door open and I got up to close it. A minute after I closed it and was heading back through the apartment, a loud bang went off. I probably thought somebody threw a firecracker at our house. We heard firecrackers all the time, but a person had shot through our door and my older sister was wounded. We think that someone used to shot off, sawed off shotgun. Cabrini was brick inside and out. The door wasn't steel, but it was really thick, good quality wood. The thickness of the door must have slowed the force of the bullet. My sister was shot in the back of the head. So much of what happened afterwards is just a blur. <clears throat> We lived on the 13th floor and I think my father had to walk down the stairs with my older sister. The elevator wasn't working and no ambulance came. My father wouldn't have been able to catch a taxi cab. You rarely saw cabs in the neighborhood because of the gang activity. So my father must have drove. My mother went with them. They went to the local hospital in Roten over on Oak. My sister was treated there for maybe a couple of weeks. I remember when she came home, her face was really, really swollen. She didn't suffer brain damage. The shooting didn't paralyze her. She survived, but to this day, she still has buckshot in her. When it rains, she feels sore and stiff. She still has pain. The thing about ambulance and police at Cabrini is that when there were reports of shooting, they'd come eventually, but they didn't come right away. It wasn't a hurry. Police knew that shootings happened in the neighborhood on a constant basis. Nine times out of 10, they weren't gonna risk their lives when they knew it was playing out gang activity going on. It was the norm, so to speak. I'm sure that's how a lot of them looked at it. They'll just kill each other off. They didn't care. For months after the shooting happened, me and my younger siblings were afraid to walk past the door. The way our house was set up, the bedrooms were in the back, and to get to the living room or the kitchen, you had to walk past the door. I was fearful to go to the kitchen or the front room. I didn't want to pass the entrance because I was scared someone was going to shoot through the door again. I didn't have nightmares or anything like that, but I had a fear of walking past that door. My younger sister would just run past it when she was going to the kitchen. It was pretty much the same thing for me. When the door was open, it was fine, but once it was closed, that's when the fear came. Wicker Park. When I was coming out of high school, what was clear in my mind was to get out of my surroundings because I got tired of the shootings. I got tired of just living at home. I wanted to build my own life. I lived in Dallas for a while just to get away. 
and I moved from the 1230 North Burling building of Cabrini for good when I was 25, and I had my oldest son. He was five months old when we moved out to Wicker Park, and that's where we live now. It will be 18 years in September. I'm an online student now, completing a degree in medical transcription. You have to have a love of vocabulary and language in general to be good at medical transcription, and you have to know punctuation. It's not just something that you can learn overnight. My love of reading and writing was linked to, into my choice of study. My overall goal is to work from home because of my children and because I have lupus. I wouldn't exactly call it a trade, but it's like being a mechanic or a hairdresser. People are always going to be in need of people with those type of skills. Eventually, I'd like to work in a private medical practice. I wasn't studying transcription when I was first diagnosed with lupus or while I was very ill. I became ill in 1999 and I'm in remission now. But taking transcription courses, learning medical terminology and pharmacology has given me greater understanding of what to expect when I go to the doctor's office. It makes me more confident when a doctor prescribes something for me or for my youngest with autism. He's on a couple of medications. Now I can decipher some things. Of course I'll keep writing, writing something I love. The hard work is in trying to network, but I wrote these books for a reason. So I've made up a mantra for myself. Every day, just try to do something productive towards your goals. I try to do as much as I can while the children are at school. My whole life is pretty much centered around Cameron, my youngest. Whenever he's out the door, there are a million and one things that I want to do, but I have to prioritize because once he comes back home, that's it. He wants all my undivided attention and him being nonverbal is kind of tough. My angle is to eventually get a bigger place for my children to live, because right now they're sharing their room and they need their own space, you know? I love the neighborhood because it's residential as well as business oriented, and I've got the ideal place, and I've actually got the ideal place in mind. It's down the street from me, three bedrooms and two bathrooms. I don't want to leave with a park. It's easily accessible to everything. Seeing anything torn down is heartbreaking. I wrote an article last spring about the demolitions for the Chicago Tribune <coughs> on a whim. I emailed the editor and asked about the criteria to become a contributor. She wanted just two 500-word essays to see my writing style. I submitted them, and after that, she signed me up for, one, for that one assignment. That was a blessing because I hadn't worked for many years because of my children's needs due to their autism. When I wrote my article, people were still living at Cabrini Green, but I knew it was going through a transformation. Some buildings were already closed down. I don't like to watch the TV news because it's too depressing. So I first heard that they were moving forward with the demolitions on my building from people on Facebook. My cousin posted something like, oh man, it's coming down. And then my sister, she would come over to my place. She'd ask me, Man, did you see all what they did to the Burling side? They spray painted a big picture of a they spray they spray painted a picture of a big rat on the public side of the building. And I'm like, oh whatever, you know. Then I kept just hearing little tidbits here and there. Our building was the last. My father would call, Yeah, Burling coming down. They're chopping it in half. It's getting chopped down. Whatever. I still ain't seen it. I wasn't really motivated to go over there. People were saying, oh, let me get over there and go get a brick. Go get the last piece of brick from there. Honestly, I really, truly did not want to go by there. I thought, let bygones be bygones. I know the history of Cabrini. I know what could have been. Whatever. Que sera, sera. Lo and behold, I had to drive by Cabrini on my way somewhere. It was meant for me to see it. Part of me felt it was heartbreaking because it was like the end of an era. For some people, a good era. For some people, a bad era. Just seeing anything torn down is heartbreaking. Not so much that I cared it was 1230 North Burling, but to see years and years being put into something and then to see it come down, well, I look at that metaphorically. You could just build your life on something for so many years and at a moment's notice, it's all taken away from you. 
Then after thinking about the people that had spent so many years there, I started looking at the demolition technically, thinking about the construction of the buildings. I'm like, hmm, why am I thinking about the construction? I should be thinking, wow, you know, this place is gone where I lived. Instead, I'm wondering, wow, who built this place? What is wrong, you know? I almost started to cry. Then, as I passed through my old neighborhood, I was suddenly not sure where I was exactly, since I didn't recognize my surroundings anymore. The whole landscape had changed. Oh my God, where am I? Finally, I saw 1230 North Burling in the distance, but that was a scary feeling, getting lost in your own neighborhood. Thank you. I'm glad to talk and answer questions if anyone has any. Well, I just have a question from our discussion before. You mentioned urgent stories. Mm -hmm. And while I think I know what you mean from my own work, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what makes a story urgent. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think in the case of working on high-rise stories, not everyone that I spoke to shared their urgent stories. Not everyone I spoke to um, was there, was in that place to share urgent stories. So it's not that everyone is ready to tell their urgent stories all the time. But the, the narrators who are in the book, and some who aren't in the book, um, some who I'm still talking to, I think a lot, there's there's something energetically that happens when you when you talk to someone and they are really imparting something that's important to them, and it's hard. It's it's sometimes hard to put your finger on it, but it is it is something energetic. I think that um, there were there were lots of people I met who sought out this opportunity and really wanted to share their story, and sometimes it was because. They'd had a lot of time to think about it. Sometimes it was actually the fact of the buildings coming down for some people that it felt like an occasion for them too. Um, but yeah, it, it was really it was something that I perceived in 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 the approach, um, in in their approach. Um, I, I know that's that's a little fuzzy, but not really. So, so it's uh, energetically and emotionally urgent to them in ways that they might not be able to, or even my own urgent stories might not be able to articulate why at the time. But it may then connect to, it may be true and right on in the sense of connecting to a larger urgent story. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. No, I, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'll stop there. <laughs> So another hand. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you put your team together and what kind of team you use for, to, to undertake this project? Yes. Um, in the first, in the first year of working on the book, there were three graduate students I worked with at U of I, and we did we had to go through a process at U of I because it's a research one institution of applying for IR like uh, institutional review board, going through a process of um, Taking, taking seminars, filling out paperwork, and really mounting in detail like the objectives of, of what we were doing. So that took, that took some time. It took more time than I expected. But while that was going on, um, there were three graduate students in the English department who I got to know who wanted to, to work on the book. And so they, they were part of a, doing the initial outreach, trying to find narrators. We ended up finding a few narrators, or a few interviewees, uh, people who aren't in the book, but people we met early on. A couple people downstate. In um, Downstate is what Chicagoans call everything in Illinois that's not <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> um, but in, outside of Chicago, in this, in this case, closer to Urbana-Champaign. Um, so we found some narrators in Urbana. I became aware of some people who um, lived in Danville. So part of it was just trying to figure out the lay of the land, where we could find people. And once we got the green light from IRB, then we started 
announcing ourselves and letting people know we were working on this. And that team was super essential in like winding the sales for the for the project to move forward. Uh, there were a couple of volunteers in Chicago who helped out a lot also with uh, outreach. A couple of other people in Chicago conducted interviews too. In, in the first year, it was really more of a team project, and then um, from there, I was able to get and take some time to focus on it, and then I, 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 I worked on a lot of, I think, all the interviews from like the second and third year, um, finding, finding more people. But it, it helped a lot to have a team. It helped a lot to have different approaches and people who had different connections and ideas, and also to share notes and experiences with those interviews to talk about what, what just happened, what did we do, how did that go, what are we doing. Um, so that was, that was vital. Can you talk about your relationship with Voice of Witness? I'm just learning about um, its structure, so mm -hmm. explain how you developed that relationship okay. or how it came about. Okay, and McKenna is here who can, she can speak in great detail as can Luke to the history of Voice of Witness, but it is a, it's a, an imprint of McSweeney's mm -hmm. and a non uh, a nonprofit imprint that focuses <coughs> on oral, oral histories of people who have <coughs> undergone witness some sort of human rights crises, and it's an inter it looks at this question internationally. So I was aware of Voice of Witness, and I was uh, an ardent reader. Um, one of the books, one of the early books is called Underground America, and um, that focuses on people who live in the United States without papers, uh, who are here um, undocumented. And so once I made contact with the press and they were interested in the book, and Peter Orner, who edited Underground America, actually encouraged me to, to, to seek out Voice of Witness for this. And so once there was interest there, it harnessed things, and it, it really, in all kinds of ways, in terms of a framework, deadlines, accountability, um, having a, a community of people to share the book with. But this, um, I, I did feel like it fit the series uh, that, that I felt confident about. Mm -hmm. How did you fund the work? Well, there was some funding that came through the University of Illinois, so, um, and that's my day job. And they have, there's a center there called the Program for Research in the Humanities. So I, I received a fellowship from IPRH that allowed me to not teach for a semester and, and really work on the book. I also applied for money to the university, uh, the research board, and that got some money to pay the grad students who were helping me um, initially. And then there were other grants that came in from, I think the Treehouse Foundation, uh, I'm not gonna name everyone, um, but I didn't do that part alone. Um, but it was, it, it was, uh, it sort of gathered as, as we went along. But for sure the IPRH was, was big in terms of just allowing me to say, okay, I'm, I'm really doing this and to be in Chicago and, and concentrate. Oh gosh, yes. You mentioned that in our, in our first session that your initial intended audience was for people like you. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you were, you were writing stories for yourself, mm -hmm. doing oral history for yourself. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was curious to know when the transition happened, you're clearly very close to um, the narrator stories, and you're very respectful of them. So when does it shift from just writing a story for yourself to writing a story or creating a platform for, for your narrators as well? Mm -hmm. It shifted pretty quickly. I'd say that um, it was really at the outset when I thought, well, why do I want it? why do I want to do this? And it was as a Chicagoan, as someone who had thought a lot about these spaces, but also felt this very distinct distance from these places and thinking of them as over there or these places even, um, not, not having had experience on the inside, 
I, I knew I wasn't alone in that way. Mm -hmm. And I knew when the buildings were coming down, you could kind of feel it in the air, you could perceive it in the media, the way that it was this event, you know, and people were paying attention. People were, you know, it, it is on YouTube. People were showing up with cameras. It was a huge deal. And I felt like there wasn't a lot out there um, that really narrated these spaces from the inside. And so, um, so I thought of someone like me who wanted to know, who, who wanted some, somehow to, to, to get closer. I thought of someone like me as the reader. But then when I started talking to people, it, they were, it, was, it was their stories, they were sharing their stories. And that urgency that I talked about, it was real, it was deep. And I, I started writing the book to them there. You know, I, not writing the book, but I proceeded. I think that's the thing that fueled me, really, was meeting people and, and sensing that urgency from them and, and committing, you know, committing to being part of something um, that would make, make these stories um, widely available. But, but that changed quickly. I think as soon as I started, as soon as I met someone and talked to them, it, it became real. You know, it became, it wasn't theoretical anymore, and um, it, yeah, it, it just became a relationship. It became a relationship. Mm -hmm. So my question is related, but um, <coughs> though you, you did focus a lot of your writing um, towards your narrators and, and uh, affirming those stories, what kind of hope did you have um, in terms of the impact that sharing these stories would have visions or, or even politics mm -hmm. um, around cities and mm -hmm. uh, locality, mm -hmm. and maybe race and class? I think I, I don't, I'm, sh I'm sure I can't account for everything that motivates me with this. Um, but I do feel like the, um, that sense and that kind of given that so many people could see public housing, high-rise public housing in Chicago as over there, as separate, as, you know, distant in that way. I think if, if there's anything that I was, that I know motivated me was wanting somehow to explode that, um, like w what the outcome, I don't know. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know Going into it, I didn't know what people were going to tell me, but I did feel like these were spaces that many of us who were outside of these spaces did not enter, did not choose to enter even imaginatively. Um, and I, I, I knew that that was wrong. And I knew that that was, in, you know, that, that that's an insufficient way of being in relation to one's neighbors uh, and one's like, uh, I'm gonna, yeah, and so I think that that was the thing that I hoped that this would that would come out of this process was like a closing of that distance in any way. Um, I, I think with the plan for transformation, also as I got to know people and their stories and saw the way the different ways that it was being enforced and the different ways in which it was not working for a lot of people. I felt like I wasn't learning those stories either. I hadn't, those weren't visible in the media, in the press, the way that the plan for transformation was not, it was not, it was not uh, meeting its stated aims or goals. It was, it was kind of, it, it was failing people. Um, it was like a different kind of systems failure. And so I, I, I think that was also always on my mind that 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 needed to be more widely known and understood. Do you have uh, any plans for the audio? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any suggestions? <laughs> I, no, I'm just curious, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, there's more interviews than are in the book and there's more material yeah. on the narrators in the book than is in there, so yeah. I'm just wondering if you're thinking about Archiving anywhere or anything like that. I'm looking at my. <laughs> <laughs> I saw somewhere that you know, voice of witness might put more online or. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, that's a that's a conversation we're always having. And you know, the the early days of voice of witness are just like 
well, McSweeney's in general is a small press. And record keeping is terrible. <laughs> so uh, our early archives are, are a little shaky uh, for, for audio files and a lot of our other, which is really a shame. But um, we're trying to do better now. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can, we can do. Because mm -hmm. audio is, is very important. In, in many ways, I think it tells a different story mm -hmm. than the text. Um, and they complement each other. Mm -hmm. really interesting ways for people that want to really dig deeply into these stories. Yeah. I'm curious about whether or not any of the narrators felt that they had enough power to advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, they, did that ever come up in any of the conversations? It, it didn't come up. I mean, I, I think one of the, between Voice of Witnesses protocols and then IRB protocols, when we started this process, we were very um, focused and uh, detailed in describing the project to people, but also, you know, with consent forms being very explicit in those about you don't, you know, you can you can opt out at any time. This is your story, and also built into the project was back and forth with the narrators so that they saw their chapters before the chapters went to to press. So there were these different moments of um, contact and circling back and approval and more approval and we're doing this now. <laughs> are you are you still with me? And so there were there were several stages of that that um, I think are important. I, I mean I, I never had any narrator I never had any conversation with a narrator where they expressed any I think someone asked earlier where they said, okay, I, I don't want to do this, or no, well, no okay. But actually, I meant in the way of um, advocating for public housing. Oh, they, I see. Okay. Did they feel see. A, a, a desire to I form see. some type of organization instead of feeling like they're being victimized? Did they, oh, I see. Okay. Whatever? No, I hear you. And I, I, think that, um, I think that a lot of them were doing that before, long okay. before I met them. So someone like Miss Wilson or someone like Pete, um, they were active in their communities and were leaders, were community leaders. Miss Wilson was the building president, mm -hmm. active in the local council. But there were lots of people I met who were in, uh, were, were hooked in in that way and were very much community boosters, were community people. Um, Miss Wilson's husband, mm -hmm. he ran a bugle, drum and bugle corps in the neighborhood. Uh, very late in the game, I was able to meet someone who was one of his kids who started his own drum and bugle corps. And so I, I feel like that's something that runs through a lot of the stories is, um, at least for the adults, uh, that sense of advocacy. Okay. Now, there are narrators who, who lived in public housing as children um, and it's a different it's a different story there. But someone like Pete kind of grew up, came of age, stayed there, and I think that's really part of his coming of age was deciding, okay, I'm going to be here in this kind of way, and I want to. When the plan for transformation was announced, or even before the plan for transformation was announced, he was very active in a restoration project uh, at Stateway Gardens, uh, working to maintain buildings, working to keep things together, and then when things turned, he was very active in attending meetings and really um, trying to speak for himself and other people who, who had concerns about the plan. I had a question. Mm -hmm. um, in our conversation, um, like while well, everybody was uh, notching, we had talked about you seeing your book as a form of activism, and so I wanted to know, have you, this, your, this book focuses on the city of Chicago and public housing in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Have you considered expanding your research outside, like Detroit, New York, here in New York City, Boston, whatnot? And if so, do you think your methodology, the same methodology that you applied to Chicago, would work for these other cities, mm -hmm. or would you have to alter it to some extent to look outside of possibly, if not high rises, maybe predominantly black neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm awfully curious. I got off the subway at 125th, and I've been to New York before. I'm, I have family, some of my family has passed on, but I've had family in New York. So, um, and I remember, this is a digression, but I remember being here as a kid and like being confused, like, well, what's, that, what's like, what's public housing and what's not public housing in New York? Like, it didn't, like, it didn't like, make sense 
from where I was coming from. And, uh, but that's another story. Um, but I, you know, getting off at 125th today and looking at the the buildings there, which I'm going to forget their names now. It starts with an H. The uh, they're yeah, no, it's exactly. This set it's public. Is I mean, I look yeah. closely at the signs, and, and that's only the that's the only reason I knew. <laughs> um, but I'm really curious about these other high rise stories, and I'm really curious about what went down in Atlanta, you know, what went down in New Orleans. But I also respect from the outside that they're very different stories, you know, they're very dis different stories, even coming to New York and seeing, you know, the, seeing those high, rise, high rises there and thinking about places like Robert Taylor Homes and just geographically, like, and spatially, how things happen are so <laughs> different um, that I, I really respect that they're, they're really different stories, but I'm, I'm, I'm deeply curious about them. And part of what selfishly I want to do as I share this book is go to places and find out like what's, what's going on in New Orleans, what happened in Atlanta, what's going on in New York. How, how that would happen here as an oral history, I can't, I can't say that this methodology would work, but I, I can't say it wouldn't, but I just um, feel like the terms may be really different. So I can't say for sure that one could take this and just, you know, take it someplace else and it would work out in the same sort of ways. Um, so, but I'm, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, as soon as I slow down, these are the kind of things I want <laughs> to learn about. I, I really, really want to learn about. Yes? I'd like to hear more about your interest in spaces. Mm. Um, is that something you've explored in other work? I think I have, and it was really, I, I have, but I think it took working on this for me to realize that I had done it in other, in other ways, and I started off writing poetry, and then I went to school, or graduate school, writing fiction. I got an MFA, and so a lot of the work that I have done as an adult has been fiction and nonfiction. I've been particularly interested in the Great Migration and interested in my parents' migration and a big part of their story is they moved to Chicago, raised three girls, <coughs> and they didn't tell us <laughs> they didn't tell us things, you know, and there's a lot of things that they kept from us. And so that's part of what I've tried to examine in my fiction and, and in my nonfiction is the way that space lived in them and the way they kind of expected space to live in us, though they didn't give us information for that space to live in us. Like the, and, and being northern kids and them being decidedly southern and like all that ensued there. So I, I feel like I've, I've always been, uh, for a long time, as long as I can remember, I've been interested in that. I think this question of architecture and spaces more physical and larger, um, there are new questions that have arisen for me since I've done this work, for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in the editorial process you were describing mm -hmm. a couple of minutes ago in response to the question you thought Sheila asked. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is a good question <laughs> also. Yeah, they're both good questions. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, in that process and that back and forth, did people ever come to a moment where they're like, oh wait, this is like a real book. I don't want my kid's name in that book or mm -hmm. whatever. Like, do people track things? Did they ask you to change things? What what mm -hmm. kinds of things? Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, there were some re there were some things that people asked to have change. Um, one narrator did not want where she lived to be so clearly identified. Um, and this and that's all I'll say about that situation. Um, but there's another narrator who chose a, sen a pseudonym uh, very late late on in the process. A narrator who was dating someone when we had our interviews and then was not dating that person when we went back to press. So there was that kind of revision that was requested and granted to, to sort of, you know, uh, make, make that go away. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, there, I, I can probably count on like two hands um, the kinds of changes and often they were more like, okay, tuning something or like saying something more precisely or but in some cases or dialing back mm -hmm. dialing back on a certain like 
forcefulness, mm -hmm. a certain mm -hmm. like there were there there's a narrator I can think of who was very upfront, very critical of like city policy, and at a certain point when I said, okay, we're really doing this. Here's what you you know here's what your chapter looks like. That person said, uh, let me let me pedal back a little bit. I don't want to be so. I don't want to name names in the same way I'm doing it here. I don't want to point the finger in the same way I'm doing here. So that that happened too. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious also about um, what happens to the stories when you put them on paper. Mm -hmm. How does it alter or change them or what is gained or lost? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot is lost. I mean, just in terms of what you have in the book, it's really it's it's there's a lot that that you don't see that happen in those as as Luke suggests that 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 was shared and that was um, conveyed in in the in, in the actual interviews. So that's yeah, it's just it's necessarily so. It's it's kind of hard for me um, because there was so much shared. So it it felt there were times when there were days when it just felt I don't know. I just it was hard. Um, but at the same time, it, it, it is a book, and it, it can't be 3,000 pages, so there's that. Um, but in terms of what happens when it's on the page for like the narrator, um, I mean, one thing that a narrator shared with me was um, this person said, oh, I, I sound kind of country. <laughs> and um, so we talked about that. and. The narrator said it in a way that I could tell the narrator was a little bit uneasy. And so we talked about the voice, um, the things that were said and how they were said. And um, I, you know, I said that I thought that this voice reflected who this person was and reflected, it's a voice that kind of code switches, so it speaks in different registers. And I said, <coughs> you know, part of the story you share is about where you came from, where your people came from, who raised you, and this is all, it's all in your voice. And I think when we had that conversation, I think the narrator sat with it and was like, okay, you know, was okay with it. But I think there was that moment of like, for, for more than one person, like, I, oh, I said this, oh, and this is how I said it. Um, but for some narrators, they were really jazzed about that. They are like, I said this, this is my chapter. Um, it's real, it weighs something, I can hold it in my hand. So there was that, there was that part too, um, where it felt, you know, it felt like it was on the way to becoming something. Mm. You've been raising your hand for a while. <laughs> well, uh, you talked about kind of coming at it from the outside, even though you were kind of an insider, you mm -hmm. close by, and, mm -hmm. and you came at the project from the outside, and then you kind of, I feel like, got on the ground, and maybe the story transformed for you, and you found new connections, and one of the things you talked about was the, the prison prisoners, Yeah. and I was yeah. curious about, and you mentioned the complications when you approach that community, were they merely legal communications, or were there communication problems in this, and how, and how did it come about, um, how did you come across this? Ancillary. Sure, sure. Well, one of the things that I wanted to do when I first started was to talk to people who were, who are incarcerated, and to to gather some some of those histories for for the book. And I was teaching at U of I. There, there's a prison education program about 45 minutes away in a town called Danville. And so I went there and I start. I volunteered there and. I told the director that this is what I wanted to do, but I also wanted to volunteer. And it just became clear administratively at the prison that the warden at the time was not going to let that happen. And so it didn't happen. Um, and, and that was that. It just kind of, yeah. I mean, I wasn't given a lot of information as to why I was told I couldn't bring in a, I couldn't bring in a recorder. And so that kind of, that, that question. That ended that. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, this kind of speaks about what Maggie was talking about with uh, oral history in a written format. What do you think is is the most effective way to, you mentioned earlier, bridging communities between you know people who are being transformed by the plan and those who are 
outside of the transformation? Do you think that there's any particular format that's more effective than mm -hmm. than a written publication mm -hmm. when when that transformation is imminent and that kind of you know destruction of a of a community is maybe still being decided mm -hmm. and it's almost happening? Mm -hmm. I mean, I. I don't know. I mean, I, I tend to think in the moment before the axe fell that it probably if, if <coughs> there had, I don't know, if there had been more done in mainstream media, particularly vi like visual media, where you can see people talk. I mean, I think part of what I feel hap has happened or happened in Chicago is this this distancing, you know, where it is over there, and and a lot of people are like, just make it go away, you know, um, and the buildings become just symbol symbols, and I think it's really I think when when these narrators speak for themselves, something can be closed or something can be opened, um, and I, I I my first response to your question is I think maybe if something had been done that was visual. Actually, I just for I think for impact and immediacy, that maybe it could have it could have proven to be a powerful intervention. But I think it would have had to. I mean, it would have it would have had to have been a mass. You know, like not just one thing, um, but but really a, a different kind of shift um, in in the stories that were told and were gathered in those spaces. <laughs> um, you talked about the voice of the narrators, mm -hmm. and earlier you had talked about how the working on this book is going to influence or has already influenced your own writing, mm -hmm. and I wondered if we could take a step earlier and how your voice as a writer yourself influenced the way that you looked at the narratives mm -hmm. and the way that you looked at the entire book. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think one of the things... Uh, that I, I look for, I do look for patterns. I'm interested in patterns in what people say and how people say things. I think as an editor, I, I, I think I was particularly sensitive to what people repeated. Um, but I also, you know, the way that that narrator said, I sound country, I love the way that narrator told his or her story. <laughs> and um, there was something in like small turns of phrase that I, I there were times when I'd edit and it was like a, a small turn of phrase. Like I'm thinking about Pete Haywood who says talks about his grandmother and says she said don't ever put her in a home and just that phrase don't ever put me in a home like what a home mean you know what a home means in that context what a home might mean in another context what he was saying was she didn't want to be put in a retired you know she didn't want to be put in a nursing home she didn't want to be put in a place with old folks only she wanted to stay in her neighborhood with her family with young people don't ever put her in a home but it was something you know in how he put it that it just rang in my ear and i feel like it's just I'm that kind of I'm just that kind of listener or, I, or like I I have that relationship to language where like something like that stuck out to me and I wanted to make sure it stayed even though you know it's not you know there were other things he said that modified that that described that but it was that phrase that I was I thought wow you know it just it just like hit me somewhere and so I feel like that way of listening and thinking about language, I think it informs some of the smaller choices or like what I, things that I kind of honed in on um, that people offered that they might not even think they were saying anything that was critical. But I felt like it was resonant. It was sort of more largely resonant to what they were, what they were saying. And it's in the back. Uh, uh, I was just following up on what you just said. I do think so. I do think so. I think every narrator's voice here is singular, and I think that's part of what was really important to me in the editing process was to 
um, to yeah to really honor honor that singularity and it was about the, the ways that people spoke and like the music in their voice or the terseness or you know the elaboration of things or the circling like it's a hard thing to do where you don't want to lean on anything too much when it's in written form but I but I it was how people spoke that that um, I'm, yeah that I, I really wanted to try to do justice to mm -hmm. <laughs> okay <laughs> How did, how did you learn how to interview? Trial and error. <laughs> I mean, I started, as, as mentioned in this earlier on today, I started, and we started when I was working with um, Crystal and Eric and Michael. We came up with, like, okay, what are, what are like, questions? And so what, what was clear was that these questions, mm -hmm. the initial questions should focus on the spaces themselves. And um, and then I think I trusted that that would leave a lot of wiggle room. But if people could talk about their apartment, their building, their floor, what they saw when they looked out the window, who was their neighbor, you know, was there a grocery store? Where was your school? Like these kind of things that were more you might think of as like orienting details. They I think they ended up lending themselves to. Um, and settling in and following certain things. And so I that's kind of that's that's how things began and I think I just kind of learned learned along the way. But I think also reading, you know, reading other reading other oral histories certainly I think those inform me on a deeper level, uh, whether it's Peter's book or or Seth Turkle's work also. Yes. Um, I had a question about um your field work, I mean, in terms of you know, field notes, was it, when you took field notes, was it more like a journal entry, um, or was it more like just rambling thoughts or keywords that somebody may have mentioned when you took field notes? And if so, how much of your field notes is used in the book? Mm, not, not many. <laughs> I mean, I really, I really leaned on that that uh, digital recorder. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, after I would come, I mean, everything was digitally recorded, and when I would come out of and there, uh, an interview, sometimes I would just, I didn't always take notes. I mean, sometimes I just, I would come home and talk to my sister, talk to my husband, and say, you know, I heard this story, or I'm thinking about this right now. Sometimes I would take notes, but I think it was very, um, I was, most of the time, I was just writing down things that I wanted to ask next time, and just kind of having that conversation <coughs> with myself. I didn't, I didn't do a lot of like beyond like what was in my mind. A lot of um, fleshing, fleshing out after after conversations. I would listen again to the interview before I went to the next one, and I would remind myself of what we did, and then I would use that as a way to launch back into the conversation, and that that turned into my process. Yes. Backing up, you, you mentioned briefly about the process of going through the Institutional Review Board. How did or did that process of thinking about the ethics of the project change it at all, or how you were approaching any of your questions? It, it, it made a difference in that I did, I think that was really the thing that prompted those questions, you know, the, the, the preliminary questions, because they wanted to know, what are your preliminary questions? <laughs> <laughs> so somebody needed, needed that from me. Um, I don't know if I would, now that I think of it, I don't know, I, who knows, but I think, the, I think that process, necessarily it made me more deliberate and it made me have to think through procedure. I mean, I, I, I believe in IRBs, I believe in the work they do. I mean, there were times when I went through the process where I felt like, why am I, why do I have to go through this? Because um, it felt like a very, the process at times felt uh, like, I guess it's all, I mean, it felt adversarial in this way. And like, this, it felt like sometimes there were these assumptions that like, this could necessarily hurt people, like this project could hurt people. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I, yeah, so it was, it, 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 it made me articulate some things um, and that was really, really helpful. And I think it also just made me slow down and think about the whole process. 
Um, and that was that was helpful too. And, and adding that extra layer of conversation in the end, I think that was a really good thing. Um, but I think as a writer, as a as a as a person who's read works like this before, who appreciates works like this, I felt like the board didn't. I felt like the board didn't necessarily understand what this was, um, you know, from the outset. As we moved through it, 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 it became productive, but it was, it was a, it was new for me. Um, and so it was, it was difficult at times, honestly. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs>